In this module, we're going to look at Jesus as a master of critical thinking. It's easy to overlook the fact that Jesus was a thinker. I mean, we always focus on the cross, and rightfully so. We focus on the resurrection. Of course, that's the key to the gospel. So it's very easy to overlook the fact that Jesus was an incredibly deep thinker, and his critical thinking skills were second to none. Now, before we give you examples of his critical thinking skills, let us consider some preliminary uh, points that are very important about what motivated Jesus. First of all, Jesus' engagements were undergirded by the desire to attract, not to alienate the lost. He was not at, after winning arguments. He wanted to lead people and attract them to salvation. Second, Jesus' pedagogical strategy was very effective. He was a master teacher. His teaching skills were, again, amazing. Dallas Willard explains that Jesus does not try to make everything so explicit that the conclusion is forced down the throat of the hearer. Rather, he presents matters in such a way that those who wish to know can find their own way, can come to their own conclusion as something that they have discovered, whether or not is something they particularly care for or not. In addition to that, Jesus was not concerned with being politically correct, especially when it came to unmasking errors in the opinions of those people that he argued with. His opponents didn't always act with the best intentions, and Jesus was not afraid to confront them. And finally, Jesus was a master logician. His logic was beyond blemish. It was perfect. Let me give you some examples of how Jesus used logical arguments in his discourse with the scribes and the Pharisees. Amazing examples right out of the Gospels. And these are just a, a sampling of a far greater volume of, of these examples that we find in the Gospels. I challenge you to look for examples of your own in Jesus' arguments. So first of all, let's look at Jesus' use of a fortiori arguments. What is an a fortiori argument? It's a very persuasive argument that builds the case for a particular proposition by showing that it is even stronger support than related propositions that are already accepted as true. I know that sounds a little confusing, but let's look at it in practice. In Luke chapter 13, verses 14 to 16, we have the story of Jesus healing a lady who had been sick for a very long time. He did it on the Sabbath. That created all kinds of problems. And he was being attacked for violating the Sabbath. So he presents this powerful argument. Premise one, if we could break it down into premises, would be something like this. Loosening the cattle from their stalls and taking them out to drink water on the Sabbath is something you guys do all the time. Premise two, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, is far more valuable than cattle and she has been bound by Satan for 18 years. So what's wrong with loosing her on a Sabbath? In conclusion, it is, if it is acceptable to loosen the cattle on the Sabbath, then it should be even more acceptable to loosen this daughter of Abraham. Think about the power of that argument. They couldn't respond to that. The logic was perfect, flawless, and very, very convicting. Now, how about his use of the disjunctive syllogism? Remember, that's the argument by elimination, the either-or argument. And in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, again, Jesus is being challenged by the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes because he has healed a demon-possessed man. And they're telling him that he's doing it by the spirit of, of, of Beelzebub and all this argument. And he finally summarizes it and he gives them this argument. He says, either you are with me or you are against me. That's premise one. Premise two, he tells them that they were obviously not with him since they were attacking him. So the conclusion, therefore, is that they were not with him. They were against him. It's a perfect example of a disjunctive syllogism being applied by Jesus himself. Jesus also used hypothetical syllogisms. Remember, those are the chain arguments. If A, then B. If B, then C. So if A, then C. Consider the words of Jesus to his disciples prior to sending them out in Matthew 10, 40. Premise one would be something like this. If they receive you, then they are receiving me. Jesus is telling them, look, when you go out and preach the gospel, 
If they receive you, they're receiving me. Premise two, he says, and if they receive me, then they're receiving my father who has sent me. So the implied conclusion is that if they receive you, then they are receiving my father who sent me. That's a powerful argument. Let's look at one more example. Jesus is used of modus tollens. Consider the words of Jesus in John 8, 47, where he has been engaged in a long series of arguments with the scribes and Pharisees that leads to a very powerful argument. He tells them, look, if you are of God, then you hear God's word. Premise two, you hear them not. In other words, you're not hearing God's words. What's the conclusion then? You're not of God. That's a very powerful argument. Now, Jesus was dealing with a lot of, of, of different issues in his ministry. And one of the common strategies of the Pharisees and scribes were cornering Jesus in, a, in the horns of a dilemma. It means that you're put in a position where any way you answer a question, you're going to be caught off guard. Your answer is not going to be acceptable. It's a trap. And I'll let you read the articles attached to this module and do the exercises, and you're going to see amazing examples of Jesus escaping the horns of a dilemma. I hope this encourages you to see that when we engage in critical thinking and logic and argumentation, we are also imitating Christ in doing so, in using the mind He has given us in such a powerful way. This is Dr. Juan Valdez of Academy of Hope, and that wraps up Jesus, the Master Logician.